Keep going. <laughs> morning, everyone. Thursday morning, we have uh, 101 talks and a couple of announcements, as usual. So let's get through those. Here's our nice group photo from yesterday. Uh, I believe it will be distributed to everyone via electronic means, at least during the day or tomorrow. Um, so look out for that. Reminder for the story time. So it's been a few people in yesterday, four, four people yesterday, eight more signed up for this morning, and there's more slots in the afternoon. Your chance to tell your story in front of the camera and be preserved for posterity of how we built LSST. Um, breakout slides, the, uh, the stuff nobody wants to do. I believe there's still nothing in the breakout slide deck. Hmm? Seven, oh, all right. there's a few, okay. Um, so please uh, click on the link, go through and add in a, a one slide summary of the breakout sessions that we were having the last couple of days and they will go through on Friday. And reminder for tonight, we have the public lecture uh, that's in turquoise, that's this room, right? That's this room here. So a big room at seven o'clock and that should be very interesting. And we're encouraged to mingle with the audience afterwards and tell them wonderful things about telescopes and big data and all of the other things that we do. And last, I think, is the LSST Asia. So this is a new event over in Asia for LSST at Asia next year in Australia, 20 to 23rd of May. Um, and Sarah is here somewhere. No, she's not, she's not willing to stand up. No, okay, well, she's around. I've seen her, so I know she's here somewhere. Um, so please talk to her about that. And there will be an exit survey. So this will be sent out to you like, I think we did the same thing last year. You'll get it in an email, it'll be on community, click through, and you can tell us all the good and bad things like that it was too cold in this room the entire time, etc. And we'll try and do something about it next time. Uh, so we could do jumping jacks, I was told, if you wanted, before the talk start this morning. Uh, last but not least, I really think this is the last one. Um, there was from the comment from the hotel staff that some of us get special meals like me. We have a little ticket and it tells what kind of special meal you want. If you don't put it on the table, they don't know which one to give you. So you need to put it on the table um, and not just say to them, I want the special meal for X. Uh, so please do that. And don't forget to take away the piece of paper with you afterwards for the next time. Okay, oh, and thank you to Heather for the, uh, the wonderful Lego pieces. Yes. <laughs> Everyone enjoyed that. That really was the last one. Okay, so there are three talks. First, first up is Doug, then we have Marco, and then we have Colin, so I'm gonna hand over to Doug. Yep. Uh, Just transfer. Uh, you right. gonna do that? All right. All the way at the bottom. Yeah, we didn't reset it. Hello, I'm Doug Neal. I'm the chief engineer for the Telescope in Sight, and I'm trying to, going to try to explain the entire Telescope in Sight in 25 minutes. Okay, here's what tele the Telescope in Sight. Of course, it starts with the telescope, and everything on the telescope except for the camera it includes the rotating enclosure, also called the dome. And okay, can't very see this very well. The dome. The piers for both of these items, note the advanced state of these piers. The uh, telescope piers actually got two stages and a flare on the top to give it extra stiffness. We have a large vertical reciprocating lift to carry stuff to this level. We have in a service building with a coating chamber in it, uh, the control room and the utilities on the bottom. We also have an auxiliary telescope and a base facility. Starting with the telescope, we have an 8.4 meter aperture, which is defined by our M1 mirror. It's got a very wide field of view at 3.5 degrees. This quite requires an extensive amount of stray light suppression. We have a very high cadence. We have two exposures back to back of 15 seconds, and then only five seconds to move three and a half degrees and be ready for another exposure. In some places say four seconds. It's four seconds for the TMA, five seconds for the optic system. That gives us one second extra to let the active optics converge. And we conduct our survey in six different optical bands. Here's what our telescope system's optical system is. We have a primary mirror, Light hits the primary, goes up, hits the secondary, hits the tertiary, and goes into the camera. You note there's some very unique aspects of the system. First, the M1 and M3 are single monolith. This actually has a great benefit because it's very difficult to align this telescope. So consequently, these two optical surfaces are aligned in the factory, and we don't have to worry about aligning them on site. We also have no deformable mirror, which is unusual for a modern telescope. A lot of the reason is we're looking at a very wide field of view in the sky, so we can't correct 
the entire sky because it varies over the sky, so uh, deformal mirror would be less useful than normal, although it also puts uh, higher requirements on our figure control. We also don't have a fast steering mirror, which makes it more difficult to, pound, uh, to point correctly. Thank you. Okay, here's our major components. There's the actual mount, which includes everything except for the M1, M3 mirror cell assembly, right? That's the M1, M3 together with its cell. The M2 mirror cell assembly, which is everything with the M2 with its cell, and the camera support assembly. This camera is supported by the camera grip, but we usually refer to this hall as a camera support assembly because it is installed and removed as a single unit. Okay, the a TMA actually has very rapid motions. These are actually the minimum required motions for the mount for acceptance of it. It actually can move uh, significantly faster than that. And we need this to make our rapid five degree, five, five second, three and a half degree slew. It also has to uh, track extremely well because lack of a fast steering mirror has a significant amount of baffling on it. And we also have to uh, design this thing to be able to remove the major systems. Having a compact telescope makes it much easier to meet our slew and settle requirements and it gives us the rigidity we need for pointing. It also makes it more difficult to remove and install things. So we had to design the system to be able to re remove and install the major components. Uh, you need the high natural frequencies for a rapid uh, repointing and for precision tracking. You get high natural frequencies by being stiff relative to your mass. You can't just throw more uh, steel on it and make it more rigid because if you do that, you're throwing more mass and you don't gain anything. So you have to design it really well to get these, the high frequencies that you need. And these high frequencies also help in the reject vibration problems from wind, the TMA drives, and the dome drives. The vibrations, normally people consider vibrations, they worry about accelerations. We worry about displacements. Because of the second differential effect, the displacements are what de deg degradate your image quality. So consequently, we, the higher the natural frequencies, the lower the image degradation. Okay, we've designed the TMA to be very low maintenance, and one of the ways you do that is use hydrostatic bearings. These bearings are shown right here. They're essentially, all you see there is the bearing. It's a pad that has high pressure oil that is injected to it, and the telescope slides on this. This is how the elevation axis works with two bearings on the bottom and transverse support by, provided by the other bearings. Consequently, these things have very low stiction. Stiction is the ability to, to move small amounts without uh, stopping. So to move those, make those very small motions you need to track a telescope, you need low st stiction, and these kind of bearings provide it. They're also very simple in long life. Note this has no moving components on the bearing system. Right. Same thing with the linear drives that are used to actually drive them, the motor. The linear drives make the telescope action as, act as one giant motor. So here's the, uh, the linear drives for the azimuth assembly, and they effectively make the entire azimuth assembly the rotor for a motor. So think of the whole telescope as a big motor, right? So that eliminates the backlash you normally get from a gearing system. It's also very low life, it has because, long life because it has no moving parts. And it also eliminates this problem of the inertia of your drivetrain. Most people don't realize normally when you're accelerating something, it's not just the inertia of what you're accelerating you have to deal with, it, it's the inertia of the drivetrain. The inertia of the drivetrain can be larger than the inertia that you're actually trying to accelerate because of the square effect where the inertia, the, uh, the, the gear ratio has to be squared to account for that inertia. So consequently, we eliminate that by having these direct drive motors. Not shown in this picture is all these are operated off of a capacitor bank. It takes a tremendous amount of power to rapidly move this telescope, and if we had that going directly off the power lines, the draw would be too high. We'd affect every other telescope on the mountain. We'd make a lot of enemies really quickly. So what we do is we have a large capacitor banks. The power system for the mountain feeds the capacitor banks. The motors run on the capacitor banks. We also have to have three different cable uh, wraps to get the cables up to the camera. So we have an azimuth cable drape, which comes up. This goes in the center of the azimuth assembly to bring the, the lines from the fixed facility up to the azimuth down here. Then we have two elevation cable drapes to get lines from the azimuth assembly to the elevation assembly. And finally, we have a, th a third one to provide the cables into the camera. Uh, Cable wraps are actually one of the more difficult things to build on a telescope because they have a very large number of lines and they are inherently one of the more problematic parts of maintaining a telescope. We also have to have a large number of auxiliary components. Here is shown the mirror cover. It's actually a cloth cover, a very thick, high-tech, strong cloth, but that allows it a lot of flexibility so that, if, for instance, if something drops from the top of the dome, 
it hits this, instead of breaking it, it just bounces, right? You notice there's a hole in the center of our mirror cover, and the reason being is that's what the camera covers. The camera's about, it sits in here, the M2 baffle sits there, so there's no point in trying to cover those because you'd actually hit them. So, yeah, right, exactly. We also have to have things like brakes to hold the telescope still. Here's a stop to limit the range so we don't overdo the range of the, the, uh, the cable wraps and well, encoders. So there's quite a bit of complexity. We also have, have balancing units on it. Our mirror weighs 17 tons, and we are able to move it slightly with millimeter range with our control system. Consequently, you have to be able to rebalance the telescope because the telescope needs to be very well balanced about its elevation axis. Otherwise, you're creating a lot of heat trying to hold it in place. So we have balancing units on the actual telescope. The M1-M3 is shown here, and it's a cast borosilicate mirror. The reason we have a cast borosilicate mirror is the most common type of mirror used for this size of telescope. As I'll show later, we have a different, entirely different mirror for our M2. But this is lick, you know, the, the, the uh, glass is melted and cast into, a, into this form right here with all these hollow pockets, which allows us to cool the mirror, as I'll show in the next slide. We also have, uh, we have an active pneumatic air uh, system to support the mirror, so it essentially floats on a, a group of pneumatic actuators when it is operational, and we have a separate set of passive supports, which are shown here, which are wire rope isolators. So when it's not supported actively by its pneumatic supports, it's supported passively by its wire supports. We also have a very ex extensive thermal control system, some light baffling, and in the middle is a laser tracker, which is used to align the optics uh, before imaging every night. Here's an, a better view of the complexity of the support system used on this mirror. You, can, you notice that the, we have red and blue actuators. Most of the actuators are dual axis. They provide force in both the transverse direction and the axial direction. It's much more flimsy in the axial direction, so we have some that are only axial, which are shown in red. Right? There's a couple that, all these ones up and down provide support when you're horizon pointing in that direction. We have 12 that go transverse to that to provide for, force for dynamic loads and for wind loads. These actuators then are attached to these load spreaders, which distribute the load throughout the mirror. Here's what our actuators actually look like. Here's a typical dual axis actuator. It's got two pneumatic cylinders, and they're at 45 degrees, and we use the forces together to provide the transverse and the axial support. Every actuator has a load cell, and they're all force control. We control the airflow into the cylinders to control the forces on the actuators. These actually have very low stiffness. They are essentially floating on air. The position of the mirror is, is determined by what we call hard points, right? These hard points inherently are not supposed to push on the mirror. They're only supposed to locate it to so the, the exact opposite of the pneumatic supports, which provide force without locating it. These locate it without providing force. The way we do that is each one of these has a load cell in it, and the load cell then is used to operate the pneumatic supports and any force that is recorded on these by the load cell is offloaded by those uh, pneumatic supports. If that system isn't working or doesn't work right, it also has what's here is a breakaway mechanism, which is essentially two cylinders pushing against each other. So during normal operation, this thing is very stiff, provides high frequencies for locating the mirror, but if you have too much load on it, it becomes a constant force mechanism and breaks away. So this is the actual force displacement curve of these mechanisms, the breakaway mechanisms, and the hard points. The thermal control system serves two separate functions. It controls the temperature of this surface, which greatly improves local sing, and it also controls the thermal gradients inside the mirror. This is a borosilicate mirror, so it does, has a relatively large CT relative to other mirror glasses, so it tends to warp with any kind of temperature gradient. So we have very specific temperature requirements for this mirror. The way the system works is not that obvious. Down here we have a mirror cell, right? Here's the mirror, and between them there's essentially a plenum. What happens is these blowers, these fan coil units, they have a blower in them, a heat exchanger and a reheater, and they blow air from the intermediate area here down to the mirror cell, it effectively slightly pressurizes the mirror cell, which then with these 1700 tubes blow air in each one of these uh, pockets inside the mirror, and then the honeycomb cell, and the circulating air then comes back through the blowers. We overcool the air somewhat with the fan coil units, and then we reheat it slightly with the reheater so that we can much more accurately control the temperature of the air in the system, which then controls the temperature of the mirror. 
Here's the M2, and you notice it's very different technology. Instead of a cast mirror that's got structure, it is a miscus mirror of constant 100 millimeter thickness, and it's a different glass ULE. The reason this is so different, we are using the technology that was available. Most four meter class telescopes are made with this kind of technology, so that's why we call it, use an entirely different technology for the M2 mirror. It's all electromechanical. The other one is all pneumatic. This one's all electromechanical. The structure's steel. It's got a support ring on it. There's, it doesn't have thermal control on the actual mirror because it doesn't need it. First of all, it is downward facing. It's up in the sky. The actual seeing effect is much less from temperature, and it, it's actually deformed less from temperature because of ULE, and it's better cooled by the wind. All right? Sorry, didn't, there we go. Missed something. Oh, there we go. It jumped. So this has 72 axial supports and six tangent links. The tangent links provide force in the two transverse direction. The actual actuators provide force in the axial direction. The way that they work is they have a load cell in them and they have a displacement actuator and they use the inherent stiffness of the member to turn a displacement into a force and they're actually controlled by force. This has a breakaway mechanism on it similar to the hard points in the other in the mirror, which is just two spring sets pushing in opposite directions. So it actually has a, a similar force displacement curve to the hard points of the M1, M3. The tangent links here are an uh, uh, unusual design in that you cannot get an actuator that gives you the properties you need for these tangent links. So this is actually an embedded lever system with a ratio of about seven to one. Otherwise, this actuator would have to have seven times the load capacity and seven times the resolution. So this allows us to actually make transverse supports that I can use an off-the-shelf actuator. To define the position of this, we simply turn three of these off. That defines three degrees of freedom on the mirror in the actual direction, the two bendings. And then for the transverse direction, three of these are turned off and three of them are turned on. And that's how you define the location of the M2 relative to its mirror cell. Okay, next we have the hexapods. We have to align these three, uh, three optical systems and they vary as a function of elevation angle. So we have large hexapods which control the camera and the M2 mirror. The mirror actually bolts onto this blue frame right down there. That's the M2 mirror, I should say. The camera is in the hex, it's rotator at a single unit. They bolt directly onto the camera, right? And then the structure for the TMA bolts on back here. The actuators that we use on these members are actually rather unusual. They have a very high gear ratio, which gives them a very high stiffness and a very tight resolution, but they actually move very slow. So we had to give up that, the, the speed, but they are fast enough to follow the deformations of the TMA as it moves around the sky. We also have a very small stroke because they're so crowded up there that we can't move it very far before we're going to run into anything. So we have a small stroke, very in, in low speeds. To, uh, it also has to have power off braking so that we don't have to continuously energize this guy when we're doing our imaging and, and produce a lot of heat. So as soon as you turn it off, it just stays there. So you, you, during a slew, you move it a little bit, and then you turn it off. And next slew, you move it a little bit, and you turn it off. It also has uh, flexures on the ends because we need very high repeatability in our system because it essentially op operates open loop, which is a complicated control thing I don't have time to explain. Okay, here's what the rotator looks like. And this rotator is actually different than every other rotator used on every other telescope because we had a problem that we needed a rotator that was both very stiff and light. All rotators that I'm aware of use a slew bearing, which is one big bearing that looks like exactly the kind of bearing used on a windmill. This is actually not a bearing, that's a drive gear. The bearing here is these cars, right? So we have a, a bunch of carriages, which are bearing carriages that go around on a bearing ring. It's hard to see there. And these cars are aligned up with the actual hexapod legs. This is the way we are able to significantly reduce the mass of the rotator and still make it even stiffer than a normal rotator. So this rotator is both stiffer and lighter than uh, most rotators. Okay, now I'm gonna explain the basic AOS system operation. For the most part, the mirror forces for both the M1, M3, M, the M2, and the hexapod displacements and rotations work off a lookup table. There's a lot of misconception how this system works. The lookup table is prim principally the values that these use as a function of elevation angle. There are other inputs, but over 90% of the force and displacement is just from this, the lookup table and the elevation angle. The telescope and the mirrors deform as a function of gravitational orientation. As you change the gravitational orientation, the lookup tables tell these systems how to work. Well, on top of that, we also have our science camera or COM cam, which determines the wavefront error. That wavefront error is then used to determine 
what's causing the waveform error as far as deformations of the mirrors or optical misalignments, and then it sends an, a correction which is added to the lookup table values to operate the rest of the system. Okay, the system has to be designed so you can remove and uh, replace all the optical systems. This is showing how big this M1, M3 mirror cell assembly is and how it slides inside of the entire TMA right there. All right, this whole thing comes out as one unit on its own carriage, which we drive up there through the vertical reciprocating lift, drive it up into the telescope, unbolt the flanges, drive it off, and drive it back down. The uh, camera support assembly, which is a camera, it's X-Pod rotator in the R structure, so it's part TMA and part camera, is installed and removed as a single unit. As I showed earlier, the M2's got a hole in it. This thing has to slide through that hole, so consequently it has to be removed horizontally with an overhead fixture using the crane and slid in and out through that M2. Next, the M2 has to have that camera support assembly removed before you can remove it. So what happens, the camera support assembly comes out, the M2 gets lifted up by the crane, then it actually has to go over to the side before it can come out. What limits the entire height of, this, of the rotating enclosure is this, is being able to get haul enough to get this M2 out. So consequently, if we wanted to pull this through here, we'd have to make the whole dome a couple meters taller, just so we didn't have to go over the side. All right? Okay, now we're going to talk about the dome. The dome's got a lot of functions. It's obviously there to protect it from the environment, but that's only one of its many functions. It's also trying to balance the wind shake and the air flushing effects. Wind shake is negative. That vibrates your telescope, which reduces your inequality. Air flushing, on the other hand, helps your local seeing. So the more wind, the better your local seeing. The more wind, the wind shake you have. So we have to be able to balance the wind effects, and we do that with this enclosure. You see it's got a large number of vents in the side. These vents can be opened and shut in, in different levels to control the wind blowing through there to actually balance the wind shake effects with the dome sing effects. And we actually have accelerometers on all of our optical systems so we can measure and determine quite well what, how much wind shake is degrading our image quality. We also uh, have, this acts as the major light baffle for our system. As I mentioned, it's a, a wide field of view, so it's very susceptible to stray light. The major light baffle is actually the enclosure. This enclosure is very light tight. If you actually could roll off the enclosure, you'd have to build an entire another enclosure just to catch all the stray light. So it's actually the major stray light baffle. You might note that one of our unusual aspects is our lower enclosure that supports this is a solid concrete ring, and we do that because we need very uh, smooth motion for this dome, as I'll explain in another slide, because we actually operate an image while this thing is moving. Some of the aspects of our dome, it's non-co-rotating, which means that the telescope and dome are free to rotate independently. This allows us to facilitate maintenance because we can change the orientation of our crane relative to the telescope, which makes it a lot easier to, to operate. It's got a biparting shutter. Shutters move to the side. Biparting shutters are much more dependable and lower maintenance and safer. And then it has a light windscreen, which is actually similar to an up and over shutter. It's very similar to, Gem to Gemini's up and over shutter. We have the light baffles I mentioned before, thermal control and overhead bridge crane. I'll show you the details in the next ones. We also have a rear access door, big door in the back for um, engaging with a vertical reciprocating lift to move large items. The bogies here are fixed, and the, the drive, I mean, bo bogies are fixed to the uh, rotating enclosure. The drives are fixed to the pier. I'll show that in another picture. And I mentioned this all runs like off of capacitor banks. Okay, it's a very conventional steel structure. It looks a lot like any kind of a building or a bridge. All these pieces were made in a factory. They weld the, the individual pieces are welded together, and then they're bolted together on site. We're not doing any welding. The outside skin is actually corrugated aluminum plate, very similar to you see on a lot of garages. Simple system with corrugated metal and uh, insulation in between. We thermally control the interior, so it has to be insulated. Okay, here's the bogey and drive system. Right here, we see a bogey. It looks a lot like a train bogey, not surprisingly, but one of the different aspects is the transverse support is provided by these wheels right here, the red ones, rather than a train which has a lip on its wheels. The wheels in this are flat, and we have these wheels to provide the transverse support. The, um, each one of these is actually aligned with a major structural member to provide extra stiffness, which makes our drum, dome a lot stiffer and stronger than a lot of other domes. The drives now, which is unusual, are actually fixed to the lower enclosure. 
The reason being is this dome constantly moves. So if these were up on, on the enclosure, it would be much more difficult to thermally control them. So that's why they're fixed to the lower enclosure so that we can uh, control them with their temperature with glycol and prevent them from leaking heat into the optical system. We also have an inflatable seal when we're stopped so that we can prevent air from escaping through here. And, and I think I mentioned there's the uh, capacitor banks. They're not very exciting looking. They're just big boxes. If you look inside, you see lots and lots of capacitors. Okay, here's what our louvers look like. And this is a nice cross section. You see these sinusoids in here. These are actually light baffles. Each one of these is a light baffle, and they're actually black. They're not bright red. And that, what they do is they prevent the actual light from going through all of these guys, but they allow air to go through. They actually improve the airflow because they make the airflow more horizontal. So they're actually beneficial to the airflow. Then we have these louvers, which we can control in the, as a group, each, one go, each three going up and down to regulate the wind flow through here to try to balance the effects of wind shake and seeing. All of these light baffles are removable either by sliding or by rotating so that you can get in here and get access to these louvers for maintenance. Otherwise, you'd have to be way up in the air trying to uh, access them. This gives you access from inside the dome where it's safer. Two minutes, okay. There's the, uh, the light wind screen, which is very similar to Gemini. It's got uh, six different panels that move up and down. It actually has about a 10% airflow allowed to go through it to help with the, the local seeing. Here's the, how our, our system works in that we have a slightly oversized baffle which allows the, the dome to slowly move while the telescope's making this jerky motion so they don't have to be aligned. Otherwise, it would take 1,000 horsepower to rotate this dome to match the TMA. And this is how we're doing it. And this is why we need a very smooth system also because while you're doing your imaging, the dome is still moving. We have an overhead bridge canyon here, which we need to do all of our maintenance. And by rotating the dome, we can arrange the, the, over, the coverage area of this anywhere inside the observatory. We also have a hatch you can't quite see there with a 30 meter, meter uh, worth of hook travel allows us to go all the way down to the ground with our overhead bridge crane. We have the, the doors in the back, the rad, which allow us access to the vertical ship gain lift to move large objects up into the lower enclosure, and we have a large quantity of, of scaffolding, et cetera, in here. All this is made to try to facilitate easy maintenance. Lastly, the way the thermal control works is the uh, enclosure has really no thermal control itself. It piggybacks off of the system down below where we have air handlers down below. The air handlers blow up air, and these only all these are is ducting, but they have their own fan. So as long as the airflow from coming up equals this flow, we don't actually have a seal. You just align the two ducts, and it blows from one right into the other. You do lose some, but you can afford that. All right? The uh, dome also has a quite a bit of, hard, of hardware for calibration. It's got this large screen that we have to have inside, which we're still working on right now. And there we go. Here's the summit facility. This is Jeff Barr provided this. This is telescope in sight. Uh, this is the actual summit facility without the telescope or the dome on. There's a real picture. There's our service building. There's the uh, lower enclosure for where the, where the uh, dome goes. There's the platform lift. Uh, just to give you a, a, a cut through it, on the bottom down here is where we put all of our mechanical equipment so that the heat and vibration does not affect our telescope and degrade the image quality. Next floor up here is control room floor. And then we have a large service floor up here where we do all of our maintenance. Okay, here's a nicer view, uh, the actual prints for it. Just showing you, this is the area where most of our maintenance is, the main maintenance floor. Platform lift aligns with the receiving area. Then this whole area here is used for the coating chamber for coating the M1M3. Over here we have the camera maintenance area. Back here we have an area we call the utility area because it's used by both the M2 he hexapods and the M2 and the hexapods, sorry. And there's the end of part one. That's run out of time? Okay. It's all totally clear. He's going to continue for another 15 minutes, otherwise, yeah, go on. <laughs> Use the mic, please. You said that the telescope pointing is uh, driven by a lookup table. Can you tell us a little bit about how that lookup table is determined and how often it needs to be updated? Well, we don't normally call the pointing a lookup table. That's a pointing model, but it's, it's a lookup table also. And that's the difference between where you think you're pointing and where you're actually pointing. And that has to be figured out during commissioning with, a, you know, with testing where you 
look for known locations on the sky and then record where you think <coughs> you're pointing and you build a lookup table which is then a function of elevation and, and azimuth angle which gives you the offsets for where you think you're pointing versus where you're actually pointing. Right. I'm curious about the light baffling, I mean the wind baffling. So you're measuring temperature in the enclosure, but how do you decide which louvers to open and close and how much to do it? That's something we're going to have to do mostly by experimentation. We do know, because we've done quite a bit of work on this as far as computational fluid dynamics and thermodynamics, and one of the things you find from this analysis is that it's, there's quite a bit of unknown on it as far as trying to balance these. So if you try to calculate it all, you're not going to be very close. So you have to do a lot of that's just going to be experimentation on the actual uh, summit where we'll have the accelerometers on the different optics and we have ways to determine the, the viewing in, uh, the, inside the dome. And so we can go to different wind angles and try to figure out the, the optimum combination of opening lures. So that's going to be done mostly experimentally. Doug, what sort of uh, redundancy do we have in the capacitor banks? The capacitor banks are actually made to be never need resurfacing. They've got uh, more capacitors in them than we supposedly ever need for operations. So we expect them to, to many of them to, can die over their lifetime and we still can function. There's several hundred capacitors in there and they all expect to have the right lifetime. But the way that's all put together is capacitors fail we just go on operating and we have X, we just lose small amounts of our capacity. We start off with more capacity than we need, right? And from our calculations, we should never have to replace the actual, or service the actual capacitor banks. Right, they're rather dangerous. Right. Last question, we can go. I'm curious about the electromagnetic actuation uh, of the telescope. Is it held in place electromagnetically or is it mechanically locked in place when it's not moving? Uh, when it's not observing? When it's observing, but when, when it's, it's observing, it's, it has to be uh, electromechanically controlled because it's still moving, right? You can't stop the telescope without 15 seconds. You have to track. So both systems are moving, both elevation and azimuth during the tracking. We do have brakes so that you can turn the system off and it still you know, stays in one place. But for the most part, it's just going to be all those, once you're operating, you're operating under those all the time. Thank you. All right, so let's thanks Doug again, especially for getting through all those slides in 25 minutes. Right. And Margot Lopez is going to, is a mechanical engineer on the camera. She's going to tell us something about corgis and cameras, I think, or something. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Margot Lopez. I'm a mechanical engineer uh, for the camera and integration and test team, as well as the commissioning team. Uh, and welcome to LSST Cam 101. How many corgis would fit in the camera? And other pressing questions. Uh, I'm going to do an overview of the camera, uh, and then talk about current status, show some fun pictures of hardware, and what the camera team plans to do in the next year. So firstly, what makes the LSST camera so impressive? Um, many of us know this, but it is the largest digital camera ever constructed. It produces 3.2 gigapixel images. It can, see, it can detect objects of the 24th magnitude in a single image, 27th magnitude stacked. And the 640 millimeter focal plane is flat to plus or minus 11 microns. Um, so that all sounds really impressive. Um, I don't really know what it means, to be honest. Uh, for those of us that aren't physicists or have friends that aren't physicists, how can we explain how cool the camera is in some more relatable terms. So let's start with this camera size. Uh, the, it is the biggest digital camera ever constructed, but compared to the telescope that Doug, Doug was just talking about, it looks tiny. It's that little yellow, that's a mass simulator for the camera. Um, so how big is big? Uh, it's about five and a half feet diameter, 12 feet long, which is about the size of this 1961 VW Beetle. Um, but using some more interesting units, such as corgis, uh, we can use the size of a standard U.S. mailbox to estimate corgi puppy size. And each corgi puppy takes up about three quarters of a cubic foot. And that does give them some space to wiggle around. This is a humane operation. Um, so given that the camera volume is 180 cubic feet, uh, how many corgi puppies can fit inside? 
The answer is around 240. Uh, that is not a factorial. That is an exclamation point because it's very exciting. Um, they are a little bit squished, but you know, have some room to wiggle around, get cozy. Um, and just as a side note, I do have backup slides with some additional calculations if you're interested in actually downloading the slides. Moving on to the resolution. So 3.2 gigapixels sounds like a lot of pixels. Uh, it is 250 times more pixels than a 12 megapixel iPhone, and those get to go on billboards. Um, so if we wanted to display one image from LSST cam using a standard 4K high definition television, how many would we need? So we know that each sensor is 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, and 4K TVs are actually around 2,000 by 4,000. So we're gonna need two televisions per sensor, and that stacks nicely in your living room. Um, you can you know, display the image from one sensor on the wall, it takes up a fair bit of space, but doable. Uh, if we wanted to upgrade to an entire raft, that's nine sensors, so we're gonna need 18 televisions, and we're starting to take up a lot more real estate now. Uh, that's about the size of eight twin beds, or for those of us that have been out of college for a while, four king beds, um, and, or uh, two ping pong tables. And so again, service area is increasing, a little bit harder to display this in your house. Um, maybe you have like a home movie theater or something, I don't know. Uh, and then if we wanted to scale up to the entire camera, there are 21 rafts in the camera with nine sensors each, so we would need 378 televisions. Uh, and for scale, that's about half a basketball court. Um, it's kind of insane. Next time you're shooting hoops, just imagine playing on a bunch of TVs. Um, and also a little bit harder to display. But if you really wanted to, uh, I did a quick Amazon search, and the least expensive uh, 4K TV that I found was $350. So if you really wanted to display one raw full LSST image in your house, uh, for just the TVs, it would cost $132,000. Or you could just buy a Tesla. <laughs> Moving on to sensitivity. So the LSST camera can detect objects at the 24th magnitude in a single visit. So the rule of thumb here is that every five magnitudes is about 100 times fainter, and on a dark mountain, human eyes can see up to magnitude five. Um, so the 25th magnitude, because we're rounding here, as physicists do, uh, is four sets of five times fainter. So LSST can, de can detect objects that are 100 million times fainter than the human eye can observe. Uh, again, we're getting kind of physics-y here. Not super helpful in terms of stats, but sounds pretty impressive. Um, in more relatable units, if we were to put a regular golf ball illuminated by the sun at the same distance away from Earth as the moon, LSST cam would be able to see it. So remember that you know, LSST cam is tiny compared to the Earth, and a golf ball is tiny compared to the moon. Um, and we can still see all the way into space. Uh, the golf ball is a tiny speck, not to scale, because 80 million times is hard to show on a PowerPoint, but um, there you are. In even more relatable units, if we were to light a candle here in Tucson, we would be able to observe it with LSST cam over 10,000 kilometers away in Patagonia. Um, you know, geographical constraints, Earth is round, et cetera, makes it more complicated, but the point still stands. Uh, and this is for uh, uh, the 24th magnitude. If we go all the way to the 27th magnitude and you light a candle in Tucson, it ends up being something like you go all the way around the Earth once and then down to Antarctica uh, and you can still see um, the light which is, again, pretty impressive. Uh, moving on to the flatness of the focal plane. So the focal plane, when I say that, I'm referring to this array of 189 sensors, and it's about 3 quarters of a meter across, um, and it's flat to plus or minus 11 microns. That's really small, smaller than the width of a human hair. Um, and we care about flatness because it affects the consistency of the focus. You get better images. So uh, what if we were to expand the focal plane to a more relatable size? How flat would it have to be? Well, a hockey rink is around 200 feet long, and to meet the same spec, the ice would have to be uniformly flat to within plus or minus a millimeter, which is around 10 pieces of paper. And keep in mind, you don't get to use the Zamboni to just flatten everything at once. You have to take 189 separate pieces of ice and perfectly place them next to each other so they're all flat to within 10 sheets of paper. Um, kind of insane. Uh, if we were to scale up all the way to the United States just for fun, which is um, over 2,600 miles across, to meet the same spec, the flatness of the entire United States would have to be plus or minus 240 feet. So we're just knocking out all the mountains and the deep lakes and everything that makes the US fun, uh, but really flat. Um, so uh, in sum, what makes the LSST camera so impressive? If we're trying to uh, talk to the average bear or humans, if you're not friends with very many bears, we probably don't want to get too technical. 
Uh, and instead, we can say things like, it can fit 240 corgis in it. And it has so many pixels that you'd have to cover half a basketball court with 4K televisions to display one raw image. Or it can see a candle in Tucson all the way from Patagonia. Uh, and its sensor array is so flat that when scaled up to the length of a hockey rink, the variance is less than 10 sheets of paper. Uh, so this is perhaps a more useful way to uh, relate to the magnitude and scale of the camera um, for the general population. Moving on to the current status of the camera, uh, it has most of the things you would expect a camera to have. Um, there are some optics in the front. We have a shutter, camera body to hold everything together. Um, the science raft are, is where the sensors are that actually take the image, and then the electronics in the utility trunk. And then we also have some fancier parts of a camera, such as the corner raft, which is used for guiding, among other things. Um, we have an entire filter exchange system. We have some filters that live on a carousel um, installed in the camera, and then this fancy auto changer that allows us to switch out which filter we're actually using, um, and then the cryostat, which keeps everything cold and under vacuum. And all of this gets packaged together in one beautifully complicated assembly, and we are building it at the LSSD camera clean room at Slack. So this is a screenshot from our camera a year ago. Um, and, you know, it's a big room, looks pretty cool. Uh, there's some things happening that front and center, we have the single raft testing. Um, it's called Test Stand 7, and we test single rafts before we actually install them into the camera. Um, but fast forward a year, and it's getting full. Um, there is that giant weldment in the back that's called the BOT, or the Bench for Optical Test. And we're using that to install RAS into the cryostat, as well as do full cryostat testing. Um, there's also ComCam, front and right, uh, on, in the front right, and um, lots of other miscellaneous support hardware and test fixtures and tools. So for more specific hardware pieces, the corner RAFs and science RAFs are scheduled to be uh, completed with construction around the end of this calendar year, beginning of next calendar year. Uh, the back flange, which is the main structural support of the camera, that's the part that actually mounts to the rotator uh, that Doug was talking about, delivered by Telescope Insight, has been shipped to France for carousel integration, and so they're going to build up the carousel that holds all the filters and ship it back. Um, the full-size prototype of the shutter is under test. We can see the drivetrain prototype here. Um, the data acquisition system is uh, releasing V3. The lenses, we've made a lot of progress with. The front lens has been polished, accepted for coating, and the second lens has actually been coated. And the structure that holds lens, ones and lens one and lens two together um, has also been completed, which is a big milestone. And lens three, which is the front cover for the cryostat, um, is near completion. Um, our colleagues in France have produ produced full-size prototypes of the various parts of the filter exchange systems. So that includes the carousel, and we can see that on the left with dummy filters. Um, and then the filter loader, which is needed because we only have enough space for five filters, but uh, we're making six of them, and so we're going to need to change one out periodically uh, in situ on the telescope. And then the auto changer is, again, that thing that switches out the filters um, in the camera itself. Uh, the cryostat is fully assembled and ready for science raft integration. This is a huge milestone um, that was recently achieved by the camera team. Uh, we can see the pump plate on top, a uh, view of the grid from the bottom, and then all the internals there on the right um, without the, before the housing was installed. And speaking of science raft integration, we, uh, as Diane was mentioning yesterday, we did successfully insert a mechanical test raft into a mock-up of the cryostat. And in order to test our raft integration fixture, and we've already begun installing mechanical test rafts into the real cryostat now, um, in anticipation of um, testing the cryostat. And that is actually a very challenging engineering problem. We are installing million dollar hardware uh, right next to each other with only half a millimeter separation, uh, all the way down to 250 microns in the worst case. And if you scale up, that's like parking a row of million dollar Maserati sports cars about an inch apart. Um, or even less in the worst case scenario. And it turns out people don't usually do that with million dollar sports cars. So if you want to get a real idea of how close it is, you need to use a much less valuable vehicle. <laughs> um, moving on to upcoming work for the next year, uh, the camera team basically has these two main branches of uh, integration and test. So there's a cryostat branch, um, that's the top bit in blue, and in that, we need to uh, install all the rafts into the cryostat and do all the testing for the vacuum and refrigeration systems and the utility trunk integration. 
And then in parallel, we can work on the camera body, which includes uh, installing the shutter and the auto changer um, and testing uh, the, the interfaces with the back flange. And we have a big stand that we're testing on. And that uh, red vertical line in the middle is the point where we install the cryostat into the camera. So that's going to be a really big milestone for the camera team. And it's happening a little over a year from now. Um, more specifically, in the next year, besides avoiding Tucson as much as possible, because I much prefer playing soccer at noon as opposed to 6 in the morning, um, the camera team is going to finish assembly and testing of all the signs and corner rafts, complete construction of the camera body, shutter, utility trunk, carousel, and auto changer, uh, we'll fully load the cryostat and prepare for that uh, camera cryostat integration, and build the camera integration stand, which is uh, this giant fixture that we're going to use for holding and testing the fully assembled camera. And to give you an idea of how big that is, uh, that person is about six feet tall, and um, this thing is going to be built in our clean room, which as you saw, there's plenty of space left, so it's going to be fine. Um, and it's uh, going to be sort of the next big, exciting thing to happen in the clean room. Uh, so this is a slide, sort of a non sequitur, but I grabbed this slide from Vincent's talk at the Joint Status Review, but I really uh, wanted to highlight how the LSST camera team is really a multinational team. Um, we have collaboration from many different partner institutions, and it's really cool to see the diversity in the project and getting to work with people from many different institutions in different countries. Um, so I thought that was just a fun way to visualize how diverse we really are. So in summary, LSST camera is quite impressive. I wanted to thank uh, Martin Nordby, Tony Tyson, Kevin Real, uh, Vincent Rio, and Diane Haskell for inspiration and help with the analogy slides that made up the first half of the presentation. Um, the camera team has built an incredible amount of hardware so far, and there's much more to be done. Uh, so it's an exciting time for sure. Um, and if you try hard enough, anything can be measured in units of corgi puppies. So thank you for your time. Okay, so we have a lot of time for questions. Nobody? Yep, please come up here. There's another microphone over on the other side if people want to go over there. Hi, How long will the, uh, the shutter uh, take to completely uncover the camera? Uh, I don't know the exact specs on that. A second? Half second? One second. One second. One second. Oh, one second. Okay. More questions? Why corgis? Uh, you know, they're cute and fun. And it was in the mailbox already, so I had a size. <laughs> it's not my corgi. Did you assume that corgis were infinitely deformable, or did you take time to get the this is, this is not a strict packing problem. We're being humane. <laughs> okay, last chance. All right, thank you very much, Mario. So Colin Slater is coming up. He's the uh, deputy DM subsystem scientist, and he's going to tell us all about data management 101 this morning. Okay, so I'm Colin Slater. As Will said, I'm the WDM subsystem scientist. I'm going to give you the overview of data management. I'm focused particularly on um, things that we've been working on recently in the past year um, and sort of take this from a bit of a science focused perspective. Uh, so, the goal of data management is to deliver the data products to enable science and that's at the state of the art of the 2020s. Um, so, that's more than just um, delivering lines of code. There's a lot of lines of code we have to uh, write to do that, but it also requires many other aspects. So building up the operational capabilities uh, to support that production mode of, of uh, building data. Um, we've also been working a lot on uh, subjecting our science platform to real world usage from users to get a sense of how they're actually going to be interacting with uh, the data products we produce and the systems we provide for them. Um, and I think a big aspect that I've been focusing a lot is understanding how um, we're sort of building this shared understanding between the science community and data management for what are the types of, of 
uh, measurements they're going to want to, uh, to make on our images? How can we enable the science that's going to be really cutting edge at the time that the survey uh, turns on and really hits its strides after many uh, data releases? Um, so that's, that's something that's sort of a long-term focus that we're thinking about um, as we uh, tend towards uh, the start of operations. So from, a, from the perspective of the user, I think we can kind of summarize the main components of data management um, in this combined picture. So there's a set of users up at the top. Uh, their principal, the principal interactions they have with the, um, the data we produce for them comes through what we call the LSST science platform. So we've, divined, we've, we've described that as three separate aspects. So I'll describe the different aspects uh, in a second. The, we call it the portal, the notebooks, and the web APIs. Those front-end aspects are backed by a variety of services. So there's databases, data storage um, to contain the data releases, the alert stream, uh, various bits of um, user, uh, sorry, pr uh, storage provided for the users, uh, computing provided for the users, and tools to go along with all of that. Feeding into the set of, of uh, uh, infrastructure tools is the alert production pipeline, which gets run on a image by image uh, time scale every night. So that's giving you the fast follow up uh, events. Uh, there's the data release production uh, pipeline, which gets run on an annual time scale. Uh, this gives us our sum total, our best understanding of the sum total of the entire data that we've collected to date. Um, and under, underlying all of this is a vast array of infrastructure. Uh, computers, storage, networking, um, everything to make this run and to make this actually happen. So getting into a few of the, the details of the science platform, uh, the, the first way we expect users to interact with LSST is through what we call the LSST science uh, portal. Uh, this enables really exploratory analysis, visualize it, I, hey, I just want to see what the, the images that LSST took look like, I want to browse around the sky. This is more than just an image browser, this is images, this lets you, this is the front end to doing catalog queries, this will plot those catalog queries, the data you get from the databases on the, uh, on the images, this will do plots, so say I just want to look at what is the light curve of my favorite variable star, the LSST uh, portal will be uh, the fastest way to get that information. If one wants to go one level deeper, say the, LSS, say the portal does not provide the exact same analysis that you want to do, we're providing a set of Jupyter Notebooks that are hosted, an environment to host Jupyter Notebooks next to the data at the LSST data facility. And this lets you bring your own code, bring your own analysis to the, uh, to the data, take it sort of one level deeper in the analysis process. Um, so this also gives you uh, access to the exact same tools that uh, data management uses when they're processing the data. So if you want to tweak settings, do it your way slightly differently than we had done already, um, this is the prime environment to test those out and to run those analyses. In addition, if these tools, if you want to go beyond these tools, we also provide a set of web APIs that are really backing the other aspects. So every time that we build something that, the, uh, that underlies, that supports the portal or the notebook aspect, you have access to those same interfaces through a variety of IVOA compliant uh, web APIs. And those can be run, uh, uh, those can be used to support your own services that give you your special, access, uh, your special view of the data. Um, so this also enables you to uh, use tools that are uh, in common between LSST and other IBOA observatories. So you can connect to Topcat or, or whatever you like. So much of the work over the past year has been uh, building what we call the Prototype Data Access Center, which is really an integration environment to make sure that, that we're bringing all these, uh, these aspects together. They're developed by separate teams. Uh, we want them to be uh, strongly linked together. We want people to be able to seamlessly uh, transition between these different aspects. And so we're making sure that we're, we're testing out that integration sooner rather than later um, to make sure that you can see, uh, make a query in the portal aspect, save that, 
uh, visualize it uh, in, uh, in the portal, then do, uh, bring it to the Jupyter Notebook for either deeper analysis or send it to TopCat via the, uh, via the web APIs. In addition, we're also stress testing the databases that will eventually back uh, these data uh, the data center. Uh, so we're currently at the 100 terabyte level of, of testing our distributed database system, and that's going to gradually ramp up over the next few years to support the data volumes we expect for the first data release. Um, and as I'm sure many of you have seen uh, in the Stack Club and various Jupyter Notebook demonstrations that we've been running over the course of the week, um, we've been deploying the, just the Jupyter aspect to, um, to a demonstration environment to support meetings like this and other LSST conferences where we can give users a sort of a first taste at what this notebook environment is going to look like and also lets us see sort of what the usage patterns look like. Can we scale to however many users we have in a meeting um, and sort of identify what are the first things that start to uh, go a little haywire. Um, and this is also, the Jupyter Hub is also a prime tool for the commissioning team because we're going to, it's, it's, it would be a nightmare if we had to sort of constantly email back and forth uh, images and, and uh, Python scripts. It's really much, much better if we just keep it in one place. We can keep the analysis environment right next to the data environment um, and uh, also makes it uh, more seamless transition between uh, DM knowledge and the commissioning team. Uh, and I'll just mention one little technical detail which I think is exciting is that this is all now running on Kubernetes, or will be very shortly. Um, this allows us to orchestrate uh, containerized aspects of the, of the science platform. It gives us much better portability, um, robustness to break this down into smaller components that individual teams can build on their own. Um, I'm just mentioning this so that if people say Kubernetes, you shouldn't run screaming from the room. I think it's actually really exciting and is enabling us to do a much better job with the science platform. So I'm gonna go into a bit of the details of the pipelines now. So the data release production uh, pipeline is sort of, is giving us the sum total best analysis of the entire data set we, we have to date. So when we get to data release 10, that's going to be built from every single image that we've taken all the way from the start of survey operations. This is not just building, this is building co-ads, but it's not just that. This is also enabling uh, uh, time domain science on a long-term time scale. So say I have my favorite variable stars, the data release production pipelines will enable you to, to do all the measurements you want to do on those. Um, I'm not going to draw a, a flow chart of, of data release production because if I did that, we would be here for a little while. Um, so instead, I'm just going to outline some basic principles that we have you know, when we're designing these pipelines. So we kind of separate into two steps, or I kind of logically separate it into two steps. And one is that we want to, uh, we want to build deep coads that will give us the best set of objects down to the faintest limits. So we just identify what are the points, of, points in the sky where we think there's going to be an interesting object all the way down to the, the magnitude limits of the coad. In addition, we will difference in every individual epoch against an appropriate template to find all the, all the sources that might have appeared only for a few months, and so they, they might not show up in a coad that's added over 10 years, but we still want to be able to do that transient science on, um, on those events. So we will difference those, we'll be able to detect the things that were only present for a short period of time. That gives us the set of things which we think are interesting, and once we have that set, the union of the d deep detections and the, very, and the uh, image difference detections is what feeds into our process of measuring those sources. So we'll then fit uh, sort of moving stars where the, their flux is fixed, but they might, they might have proper motion, and then galaxy models across all the epochs for each of those objects. This is, this is the idea of multi-fit that gives you your static or quasi-static sky science. In addition, we will force photometer at that position that we think there's an interesting object, we will measure the flux on every single image that, that, uh, that overlaps that position over the entire history of the survey. That gives us a, uh, a light curve from force photometry so that you can go back and find your variable stars or your, uh, your supernova that appeared for a, a short period. I'll, I'll, I won't go into the sort of implementation details there much further, but I'll just sort of highlight a few algorithms that have been 
uh, recently added to the processing pipelines. Um, there's many more than this, but I'm just going to highlight some. Uh, so we've heard a lot about the new deblending framework. So anyone who's been in the blending workshop has, has heard all the details about this, but this is designed to give us much greater flexibility in uh, sort of uh, using our scientific intuition about understanding how to separate sources. We've also been building al uh, algorithms to build co-ads that are much cleaner. So if we have a thousand images overlapping on one patch of sky over the 10 year survey, uh, you, the most naive co-ad algorithm is just going to give you the, the sum total of all the image artifacts and satellite trails and, um, and image ghosts uh, over that entire survey. That's clearly not what we want for uh, data really, for building a nice co-ad. So it, what we can do is we have the capabilities of doing image inferencing very robustly. We can use that to identify uh, uh, non-astrophysical sources of light that appear in the images after the image differencing. So we can find the satellite tracks. We can find the places where some little reflection happened and uh, scattered a little bit of light into the image. Mask those out so we don't include those in the co-ed and then build a co-ed only of extremely clean images. And so there's, there's lots of into, uh, detailed pipeline development going on, but as we get closer to operations, an important part of this is building up a sort of operational capability to produce these data releases on our own. Um, so we've, uh, for the past many years, uh, the LSST pipelines and the Hypersub Prime Cam pipelines have been very closely related. They're now the same pipeline, uh, but they've Historically, the uh, Hypersub Prime Cam team has been building their own data releases separate from the LSST team. And so now we're starting the process of building those data releases, or at least a, a subset of the data. We're building our own versions of those data releases at the LSST data facility to build up that operational methodology and testing at scale. And then eventually, this will become the, one of the data sets that we have available in our science platform to test. Uh, let's test all those integrations that I described, but on actual LSST-like data. And I just want to highlight HSC for another reason, which is when I talk about building that understanding of how we do science um, in the area of LSST, HSC is a great way to, to think about that for uh, particularly in the static sky science. So I've, I've highlighted a few galaxy uh, cases that I'm particularly familiar with, but uh, it's, it's one thing to think in the abstract about what one does with uh, uh, wide, wide field images at eight meter depth on LSST, but when you have the images in hand, then you can start thinking more realistically about like, well, how do I go identify, uh, in this case, um, uh, Ex, uh, tidal streams that are or shells on the outskirts of faint galaxies. What sort of algorithms do I need to write in order to detect those over a survey the size of LSST, or to or to detect faint galaxies like are in the center in the center image or low surface brightness galaxies? Switching now to alert production. So this is the nightly uh, cadence operation where we're trying to find all those all those transients that they're. There are things you can't wait for the next data release in order to do your science. There are things you're going to want to follow up on a, on a nightly time scale. You're going to want to follow up an, in an hour from, from detection. So we're, we do the image differencing within 60 seconds of the data coming off the telescope. And the idea is to get that uh, information, those detections of transient sources out to the users as quickly as possible. Um, this is done by the uh, creation of alert packets and the distribution to alert brokers. Uh, this is just a slightly complicated diagram of the time scale. So time goes left to right here. Um, we, uh, this is broken up just to show that we have a 60 second time scale because uh, we're taking image, we have a 60 second time scale to get the image difference results out because we're getting new images every 37 seconds. So we're just, we would rapidly pile up images coming in um, if we weren't being very quick about getting the image difference results out. So we nominally believe we can do uh, do this with two separate strings of uh, computers doing the processing and still be ready to take uh, the next image afterwards. Um, and we're working on testing all that. The alert production pipeline is a little bit simpler, so I feel I can actually show a flow chart of this. Um, this is, I'm, I've alighted a little bit, which is the actual software that's doing the, uh, each of these steps, but just to conceptually highlight that um, 
we're taking a new image off the telescope and a template that was generated by the data release pipeline. Those are getting differenced. Uh, each of the detections that we get on the difference image we call a DAA source, difference for difference image analysis. Those DAA sources we want to put in the context of other uh, DAA sources that have been, uh, have appeared at that same position in the sky. So we don't want to just tell you that, hey, something has this flux in this position in the sky. We want to say, hey, it has this flux. And over the past 12 months, we've also got this many detections with this particular light curve. Um, so you can understand, is this an artifact? Is this a, a, a supernova? Is this a variable star? That history gets combined in a somewhat complicated point that has a whole bunch of arrows going around, going to and from it, which will be the subject of a uh, later breakout session this morning. So uh, eventually the result of this is an uh, update to the, what we call the prompt products database. This will have that record of all of those, um, uh, those uh, detections of DAA sources and their histories. And it also gets packaged into an alert packet. Those alert packets are what gets sent out to uh, the community brokers, so uh, organizations who have signed up to process those alerts, uh, do their own filtering and, and uh, sort of ancillary context uh, for understanding those alerts. Um, it will go to a simple filtering service that we will provide to all users. So if you have like, you know exactly how you want to, want to identify your one class of rare objects, this will provide a sort of uh, small scale capability to extract those, those uh, alerts and also get saved to an alerts database verbatim for um, reproducibility reasons. So we've, we've had this core image differencing capability for some time now available in the software and what we're really doing is filling out all those other aspects to turn this from just a, an image differencing capability into a full alert production pipeline. Um, one aspect of that has been uh, integrating a new correction for differential chromatic refraction. Uh, you might have heard, but heard about this at previous LSST meetings that we sort of started off with experiments to, make the, to making this work, um, and now it's sort of graduated from an experiment to an actual component in the uh, pipelines. Uh, as I said, there's a really complicated set of arrows when you go from the image itself into associating that, getting it into the database and making sure that the database is able to keep up with this incoming stream of alerts um, and able to return the high volumes of, of previous alerts necessary to do that association. So that's being developed as we speak. Um, and we're also developing the infrastructure to do integrated testing of this so we can say, not just do we have a system that works at all, but do we have a system where we can iterate on it? Can we try out new algorithms, improve, the, improve on the algorithms and show that we've actually made that improvement um, and sort of developed the a high uh, level of robustness in all of these aspects. And we're also working on uh, that, the alert distribution system, making sure that the technologies we've selected to support that are, uh, are capable of handling the, the volumes and the uptime that we need. So speaking of the, of the alert production, uh, in, the, in a similar way that the, the data release production has benefited a lot from having the hypersub prime cam data kind of sitting adjacent to them, uh, the alert production pipeline uh, group has been, has been benefiting from having the Zuki transient factory facility uh, turning on at roughly the same time. Um, so this is giving us a way to kind of understand how people are doing this type of science on a live alert stream uh, several years before we have LSST available. Um, and at the moment, so Z the ZTF is doing their own image differencing, uh, but we're also, they're also using the same alert distribution technology that we're using for LSST. So we're able to start gaining that operational experience, understanding does this, can this, will this server uh, run an entire night without uh, running out of memory or without crashing or without using all the CPU? Um, it really gives us a step up, uh, not just speculating this will work, but actually seeing it in operation. And that's valuable not just for the alert production team, but I think the ZTF is a great uh, way for future users of LSST to be able to see, hey, what does an actual alert stream look like? Um, so I'm just showing uh, the Las Cumbres Observatory has built this uh, service they call MARS, which stands for Making Alerts Really Simple, which is my favorite acronym. Um, so they just do something really simple. They just they take the alerts generated by uh, ZTF 
I should mention that one third of all the observing time on ZTF goes, is, is public, so it's not just a consortium only thing. This is public to the world. Um, and they just, they just put them on a website, so you can see the list of alerts coming in, you can see uh, the range of magnitudes, the, all sorts of uh, real bogus scores. Um, you can click on them and you can see what an actual alert packet looks like. It includes the science image, the template image, and the difference image in the same way that an LSST alert will. And there are differences in the detailed data model, so you shouldn't take this as like the absolute truth that this is exactly what an LSST alert's going to look like, look like but sort of in a broad conceptual sense, they, they're very similar. So um, if I want to think about how, what sort of tooling I'm going to want to build to support the LSST alert stream, a great way to sort of have a physical in, in, uh, incarnation of that now is to think about that tooling on the ZTF alert stream. Uh, so there's a link at the bottom. This is a great thing to just browse for fun. Uh, so that's about all I want to say. Uh, there's a lot of technical progress going on in, in, in building codes and building operational capabilities, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot, of adjacent, uh, a lot of great science that's going on sort of adjacent to, uh, to all this development that I think really guides our understanding of how we're gonna use LSST. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. So, questions on data management? You have to come over here, Adam. Oh, there's a microphone over there. Okay, sorry. And we're going to have Amanda first anyway, so here we go. Uh, what other data sets besides HSC would you plan to bring in and, and run LSST on it? In, in development or in production? Like right now or, or will we have Between available Between now to and users? operations. <laughs> So at the moment, uh, a lot of our integration test is using the WISE data set. So that gives us a time series um, yeah. information and Stripe 82 from SDSS. So those are our two uh, basic test data sets for, the, uh, for the, the science platform. We have a variety of other HSC and DECAM related data sets that we use for testing the pipelines. Okay, so those are in now or they will be? Yes, they're in the prototype systems now. So uh, are community brokers intended to be co-located at the LDF? The reason I'm asking is that uh, the alert um, from the ZTF Mars stuff seems to be about 50K. We're getting about 10 million alerts a night. That's about half a terabyte a night. How many community brokers are there? Are we giving them each a full stream? And if so, have we thought hard about the egress bandwidth? So the the assumption to date is that we are limited to the number of community brokers by exactly what you mentioned, which is the egress bandwidth. Um, so we have, we have estimated what we believe that can be, but we've not revisited that for a little while. And so I think it's, it's something that we're just now starting to fully delve into the details because we're getting close to the point of starting to think about actually what brokers are going to be connecting. So it's, it's in progress right now. When users decide to delve into the data themselves, will they have access to ancillary information like the temperature of the detector or the wind speed on the mountain or how the auxiliary telescope is working that night? Right, so in addition to the databases produced by data management in the, in the pipelines, there's also the engineering facilities database and a version of that which is, um, provides some uh, helpful summarizations will be available to all of the users in the exact same way that they get to the regular databases. So we'll be able to go to your Jupyter notebooks at some point and bring those two pieces of information together if we want to correlate stuff. That's 100% the idea. Okay, cool. What's the uh, current philosophy on the template imaging for uh, for the difference imaging pipeline. Are you going to make one just at the beginning of the survey and use that throughout the lifetime of the survey or is this something that you'll change throughout? So the, the nominal assumption is that we would rebuild templates at the time of data release production. So that would give us a new template about every year or so. There's, there are reasons why one might need a more rapidly changing template and there's reasons why one might want a, a template that didn't change quite so rapidly. I don't think we've, we've made all those detailed trade-offs quite yet. Yeah, would you be amenable to um, 
maybe having one or, or two types, uh, because you could imagine for long, long time scale transients, you don't want one that's changing every year. You would want one that was the same at the beginning and throughout the survey. Right, so um, it's hard to duplicate the template because then you duplicate all the downstream alert volumes. Um, but if you're talking about long transients, then they might be picked up better in the data release production than they are in the alert production. Thank you. Any further questions for data management? We have time, we could go back. Any questions for camera, telescope, site? All right, we have one more at least, Emmanuel. So re regarding the way you expose the data to your user, do, do you plan to use some advanced technique like Spark uh, to enable, to speed up some process directly on the data? Yes, so that's, that's one of the capabilities we've planned for is, is something that's been long known as next to the database processing. Um, some of that is, is capable just with Jupyter, uh, so on smaller scales, but we're right now involved in evaluating all the, all the possible frameworks like Spark for, for doing that next to the database processing. It's, it's definitely on our radar. I have an important question for Colin and Doug. To Colin, can you train Corgi puppies to use the science platform? I cannot. You, you, the Corgi user, can. And to Doug, how quickly can a Corgi puppy run across the dome? Ooh. Much slower than the dome can actually move. <laughs> the dome is faster than Corgi's. Yes. The, an the answer was that the, the Corgi's can run faster than the, than the dome can move, for those who were in the back. <laughs> OK. Anybody else? Final question? Are you on an early coffee break? We're done on time. Good. We're ahead. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, all the speakers. <laughs>